That's how we think about the systems. We measure everything in microseconds, not in seconds. And so when you do fusion, it's pretty wild. It's literally a flash. Fusion happens. Mm -hmm. And it's over. You start it. You do a lot of fusion. You recover energy from it. And then you turn it off before the human eye can really respond even. And there's a computer managing all this. Like, how do you even program these kinds of systems to do the switching? Is there some innovation required there? So I'm continuously amazed by what the pioneers in Fusion were able to do before the computer existed. Because they had to control things at this scale. But maybe it was pretty hard and, and, and why we've been able to be take what they did and build on it. Because now we use modern gigahertz scale computing to be able to do this. And so even when I started my career, we talked about like megahertz processors. Uh, megahertz is microseconds. That's great. You're kind of at the border of fast enough, but you can't do computation at that speed if, if all it can do is respond in one microsecond. But now gigahertz means I can do a thousand operations in that one microsecond so I can do more useful things. So we use mostly, this is way too fast for any human to respond to. So we use what's called programmable logic. So we program in sequences to the fusion system to be able to do this reversal. We pre-program it and then we run a sequence and then fusion happens. Um, and so in this sequence uh, programming language, we use a variety of them. Some of the fusion codes are actually written in Fortran still. Nice. And though a lot is now more and more run in Python. And so we do a lot of Python, we do some Java, and then we also have, uh, because of the speed of this, it's a lot of assembly language programming. Mm -hmm. So we go right to the assembly level of the programmable logic FPGAs, and we program those. And so to be able to run one of these systems, we typically have a series of electrical switches that turn on this electrical current. Those are controlled via, via fiber optic because the wires are just too slow. And so fiber optic, I can respond, I can send photons at the speed of light. And so those fiber optics can respond in nanoseconds. And then I trigger those fiber optics with programmable logic that we've programmed in the hard as hardware assembly language. As a small tangent, let me do a uh, call to action out there. I'm still looking for the best Fortran programmer in the world if people uh, to talk to them, because so many of the essential systems the world runs on is still programmed in Fortran. I think it's a fascinating programming language. COBOL too, but Fortran even more so. It's one of the great sort of co computational numerical programming languages. Uh, anyway, what, uh, in terms of the sensors that are giving you some kind of information about the system, in terms of the diagnostics, like what kind of, at this time scale, mm -hmm. what can you, collect about the system such that you can respond at the similar time scale. So I'm also calling out for Fortran programmers. So okay. <laughs> <laughs> for different reasons, yeah. but yes, great. The diagnostic systems is really one of the keys to how we do this effectively, because you need to be able to tell the system, we're gonna trigger electrical current, and we're gonna do it in a microsecond, and we need to know if it's working right. And so, in one of these FRC or these pulsed magnetic systems, you won't have just one electrical switch. I mentioned 100 mega amps, 100 million amps of electrical current. Each, even the big transistors we use can only run at 30,000 amps. So you'll end up with tens of thousands, in fact, the systems we build now, tens of thousands of parallel electrical switches, all operating in harmony together. And so you need to be able to be build a system. And this is what we spend uh, a lot of time with. And I made the joke that in a lot of ways, he lands an electrical engineering company to be able to con both program, control, and then detect how they're operating and do it all very fast. Um, so in a typical sequence, we will pre-program, the operators will pre-program a sequence, um, usually fed from a, a numerical simulation of expecting how the fusion system will perform. We start with a, a, a set of calculations. We then pre-program all of these electrical switches to a certain sequence to be able to inject the fuel, reverse it, and then compress it up to fusion conditions. And then we trigger that and then, and then let it go. And, and measure fusion happening. Um, 
but during that process have to be real time recording and and measuring all of the semiconductors and all of the switching in the system. I'm going to talk about measuring fusion diagnostics. That's a whole nother thing which we can talk about. This is just on the electrical control side. Um, and so some of the pioneering things we've been able to do is that real time you're monitoring all of these switches. You're watching who is triggering correctly, who is not triggering qu correctly. And if systems aren't working, you're shutting down this because you want to make sure that all the sequences are, are, are operating correctly. So some of the key diagnostics, it's actually pretty amazing that even early in my career, we didn't have a lot of fiber optics built into the system. And now it's absolutely essential. And so every one of these electrical switches has fiber optic signals going into it and fiber optic signals coming out understanding how it's actually operating. Um, and real time, all of these systems are being monitored by more fiber optics. Um, we call these Rogowski coils, but they're electromagnetic coils that are powered by the electrical current themselves. So as these switches are conducting, they broadcast a signal that says, yes, I'm electrically conducting an optical signal, fiber optics, that come back to a central repository where we detect those signals. Um, and so real time, we're monitoring all of this so that we know that these systems are behaving and operating at their, their optimal performance. What's the role of numerical simulation in all of this? Sort of, I guess, ahead of time, uh, how much numerical simulation are you doing? To understand how the system is going to behave, how the different parameters all come together, uh, the electrical system, and how that all maps to the, the 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 fusion that's actually generated. Yeah, the operation of a fusion system is is pretty fascinating because all of this happens on a time scale where human operators cannot be in, mm -hmm. cannot really be involved, um, and so uh, you have to have pre programmed the majority, we call them shots, you're going to do a shot. And when you're operating them repetitively and you're running long periods of times, you still have all computers doing both the triggering and the op and the measuring of, of how they're performing real time, the whole time. Um, and so um, how this typically works, at least in our systems, is that we will design a system with a combination of, with with some numerical simulation tools that we, we've developed based off of decades and decades of amazing government programs. National lab programs developed these numerical codes. Um, we use a kind of a code called an MHD, Magneto Hydrodynamic Code. Mm -hmm. um, and that's uh, for people, for the engineers out there um, who are used to CFD, computational fluid dynamics. This is very similar. You take the same sets of equations, actually, and add the electromagnetic equations on top of those. And so you get Magneto Hydrodynamic. Are you simulating at the level of a particle? Is there some qu quantum mechanical aspects to this also? Does, how low does it go? Yeah, we have multiple codes at different levels um, because one of the, the main computational challenges is, um, amazingly, even given all that we are have, been, have built for fusion systems, computers are still not fast enough to measure, to simulate everything. Um, and so we have uh, a number of codes that we use. Um, one we call fluid codes, where you treat the ions, the electrons, all these fusion particles, you treat them as, as fluids, as gases, mm -hmm. ideal gas law with electromagnetic forces. In those, we can simulate not just the fu fusion fuel, which is important, but all of the electrical circuitry. We talked about capacitors and magnetic coils and the electrical current and the switches. Well, we actually simulate the full thing, starting literally with the SPICE model, uh, more of that electrical engineering. We start with the SPICE model and use that to drive the plasma physics model. And that's one level of simulation. We use that to do design work and then also to try to understand how we think the machine will run. But then we go one level deeper and we start thinking about particles and we think about the ions and we treat the ions as particles and we look at the ion behavior. And for that one, the computational resources are several orders of magnitude larger. Uh, luckily, a lot of the work in GPUs, the AI data center work, is directly applicable to those simulations. It's been able to speed up our work, which is pretty fascinating. Um, that's a whole nother tangent we can go down. Those hybrid codes, we call them, particle and cell codes, 
uh, now treat the ions as particles. And that lets us measure and, and simulate the behavior. I mentioned the stability criteria, S star over E, the top behavior. That behavior, we now need these more advanced codes to be able to simulate. And those are more modern. Those we've only been able to apply in practice for the last few years, actually, which is pretty fascinating. Um, that the old stability rules were built off of testing, empirical tests, where now we can simulate that and we know why they work and how they work and we can do some predictions on them. And so that's really fascinating that we've been able to push those boundaries. And what are the different variables you're playing with? Are you still playing with like topology? Like what are the different variables in, in play here? Yeah. Each of the different simulations we analyze and use it to design different parts of the machine. So at the MHD level, where we have the spike, where we actually have the circuit model. Now we, uh, our design team uses this to design the circuitry where we're designing which capacitor to use, which switch to use, uh, how many cables to use, literally to that level, how big of a cable to use. Uh, so as we're doing power plant designs right now, those are the tools we're using today, every day, the team is using. Then you can go one level deeper and say, okay, let's use these more advanced computational tools to about stability to say, okay, great, but I now know the circuitry, but let's look at the magnetic field topology. How do I design the magnet, the shape of the magnet exactly, the timing of the magnet exactly? I have to trigger one magnet and the next magnet next to it and the next magnet next to it. How do I have that shape and uh, th that design? And so that's where you're using those more advanced tools. Now those, unfortunately, those are still too slow. And so those simulations may take a day or two to run. And so a data, an operator right now does a lot of simulations ahead of time, then collects data uh, through their, their operations of the machines, making these field reverse configurations, going through parameter sweeps. And then the simulation team then goes back and looks at that data and, and compares it with simulations. Um, I'm really excited about some of the things we're seeing in artificial intelligence and reinforced learning to be able to speed up that process. And so I'm, I'm, we're watching and starting to work on that now of can we now, rather than using it where we use it today, where we do a simulation to design a machine or a test, run the test, and then over the next couple of days, compare the testing with the simulation and use that to inform what we're going to run for the next set of tests. But in fact, do it more real time where you're now an operator can pull up what the AI or what the, the machine learning would have predicted it should have done and then use that to understand what's happening in, in the actual programs and the actual generators themselves. All right, so there's a million questions there. So first of all, how much understanding do we have about how many collisions happen? Can we go to the fusion? Mm -hmm. How many collisions are there and how does that map to the electricity? Uh, and maybe can you just even speak to the directly mapping to the electricity, which is one of the differences between this approach and the, the, the Tuckamack approach. So how much fusion do you get out from these systems? And that's really the right key question. So we already talked about beta, that B squared, the magnetic pressure is equal to NKT, N being the density, T being temperature. And then we talked about fusion where your goal for fusion is to get particles hot, high temperature, get the, enough of them together, density, and then you want to get them together long enough. We call that tau. So N, T, and tau long enough that fusion happens. And a lot of fusion happens more than any of the loss rates that are happening in T tau. And in beta with B squared, you know, already two of those parameters, N and T are equal. And so that tells you right away, the goal is to maximize magnetic field absolutely maximize magnetic field. And most folks in magnetic fusion, whether it's a tokamak, or it's a theta pinch, or it's an FRC, are attempting to do that, maximize the magnetic field. So we're all pushing to that. Um, what's really nice in pulse systems is that we know how to do that. In fact, um, in a pulse system, uh, researchers in pulsed magnetic fields have demonstrated over 100 Tesla magnetic fields in pulsed magnets. That's much higher than you can get in a steady magnet or what's been demonstrated so far. Just a clarification question. Uh, so maximizing magnetic field is about the N and the T, the beta. Mm -hmm. So we're not talking about tau yet. Not yet, but we need to, because that's really important. Okay. Um, and so we can even talk even a little bit further about how fusion scales. And so in fusion, the hotter you get the fuel, the more fusion you get. Um, and we know that by increasing the magnetic field, 
B squared is in T, you increase density and temperature together. More density, more temperatures, more fusion, plus more temperatures, even more fusion. And so what we see is that in our in the in these types of systems, uh, a scaling very clearly of magnetic field to the 3.75 power, or even uh, in a lot of a lot of demonstrations, 3.77. That that specific scaling. That's a wow. very strong scaling of fusion power output um, and fusion reactions. And so that tells you you want to go to as ma maximum magnetic field as you can. Pulse systems are really powerful. Pulse systems have showed when you do pulsed magnetic fields compared to a steady magnetic field, researchers have shown over 100 Tesla magnetic fields, where in a steady system, people have showed in the 20, maybe high 20 Tesla systems. And if it's B to the 3.77 power, already you can see massive fusion power outputs by doing a pulsed system. Okay, got it. So we we maximize in the magnetic field. So that's going a uh, number go up, super up. How do you get the duration, the tau? But then I said pulsed. And pulse okay. already implies shorter tau. Yes. And so that is in the fusion field the name of the game. Folks will will have a very uh, inertial fusion. Will have a nanosecond tau, very short, but then very high pressure. They don't have magnetic fields, but very high pressure. Um, and then in stellarators and tokamaks, your goal is very long tau, but you'll have much lower density. And 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 you can't really go too much in temperature, but they'll have much lower density. And so where we live in the pulsed magnetic or the magneto inertial fusion is in the middle, um, is in extremely high magnetic fields, increasing pressure as much as you can, and then keeping them around long enough. Um, and so that gets to the tau, that gets to that energy confinement lifetime, and also it gets to stability. And so this is the thing that this field reverse configuration, which has showed that we can um, build, we, that these plasmas can last for hundreds or thousands of times. The basic theory has shown that now you can have long enough lifetimes. So what that means is in a, in a practical fusion system uh, that there are lifetimes of these high beta pulse systems between 100 microseconds and a few milliseconds, thousands of a second. And you hold on to it for a few thousandths of a second, you do fusion, and then you exhaust it. And so the whole process in this is we start with uh, a magnetic field that fills the full chamber. You then inject fusion fuel. You ionize it, superheating it now to a nice cold 1 million degrees, <laughs> but hot enough that you have charged particles, you have plasmas. You can then in, start increasing the magnetic field. You form an F, uh, a field reverse configuration and then rapidly increase the magnetic field further, mm -hmm. increasing from one to five to 10, 20 to even higher magnetic fields. And as you do that, the plasma heats, it, you compress it, increasing the field and pressure. Fusion is now happening. New charged particles are being born inside this system with a tremendous amount of heat and energy, but in charged particles. And this is where the beta really, really works in, in, in your advantage, is that just like magnetic pressure on the outside, magnetic pressure is in KT, compresses the, the fuel and increasing pressure and temperature. When the pressure and temperature of the plasma increase, in KT increases, it pushes back on the magnetic field, increasing the magnetic field on the outside of the plasma. And what that does is magnetic field is electromagnetic current and current running in a wire. And what that does is pushes current back in the wire. And so the plasma itself now pushes back on the magnetic field, pushing electrical current out of the system and recharging the capacitors where we started this whole process. All in a self-organizing way.